Okay, hello and uh, good, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Maloney, I'm the Vice Dean and Executive Director of PSIA um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event uh, this afternoon. I'll shortly ask uh, Professor Christian Leken to introduce the topic and the speakers, um, but I just wanted to say a first a few brief words about a partnership that we have um, at PSIA with Microsoft. Um, we're very pleased that over the past year, Microsoft has sponsored a series of events, um, interactive lectures, to explore prevalent challenges in cyberspace, including those related to digital diplomacy and digital sovereignty. Uh, Microsoft also sponsored the CS Youth and Leaders Summit back in January 2021. Um, that's our annual uh, flagship event at PSEA, and the theme that year was related to wars and peace, solving conflicts, and building human security. So again, linked very much to, to this theme. So today's event, which is on why cyberspace governance depends on a new multi-stakeholder diplomacy, builds on all of those previous events. Let me now hand over the floor to Christian, who is a professor of European politics um, here at Sciences Po, a former director of the Center for International Research, CERI. He's the co-editor of the European Review of International Studies, and his current research focuses on the European Union's external action and the sociology of diplomatic practices. Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mark. Hello to everybody. It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce this, uh, this conference with two distinguished uh, guests. And of course, the topic is a topic which is at the heart of, uh, I think, the uh, preoccupations of the uh, PSIA students, uh, uh, cyber, cyber diplomacy, and uh, what about, uh, of course, uh, the actors participating, which are not just the diplomats, but also uh, uh, multi-stakeholders uh, coming from, uh, well, uh, different uh, parts of the society, uh, industry, NGOs, etc., uh, etc. Et and uh, to address this, uh, this issue, uh, we have uh, with us uh, first on uh, my left, uh, uh, Mrs. Florence Gzel, Professor Florence Gzel. Uh, uh, Madame Gzel is, uh, is a professor of uh, private law and uh, also criminal studies at the University of Lorraine, but she is also the holder of a, of a chair here at Sciences Po called the Chair in Digital Governance and, and, and Sovereignty. Um, I am um, going to make it short, but uh, just to summarize what uh, Madame Gzel is interested in, well, she's basically uh, focusing her research on the way law can deal with new technologies, right? And uh, uh, of course, uh, you are also uh, 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 researching on new concepts like uh, digital sovereignty. What does it mean? So, uh, a new a new generation of uh, of lawyers and a new generation of, of questions also for uh, for the law, for the law discipline. Uh, to, my, to my right, uh, uh, Monsieur Fabien Delcroce, uh, who uh, is working for the uh, European uh, Commission, is uh, the legal officer, uh, international data protection. He has a, an extensive uh, uh, career uh, at, the, uh, at the EU Commission, uh, working in particular in, on trade disputes, right? You, uh, you represented the, the Commission uh, uh, not the Commission, but the EU. As you know, it's the it's the Commission which is representing the EU. It's 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 an exclusive competence trade, uh, one of the rare exclusive competence in uh, in Geneva at the WTO. Um, nobody is perfect. You graduated from Sciences Po, I guess. Um, yes, and uh, also from uh, from Georgetown uh, University. And currently, you are representing the EU for digital issues at the J7 and J20 meetings. So thank you very much uh, for being with us. And uh, we are going to start with you, uh, Professor Gzel. The floor is yours. OK, so I, I hope I won't be too long. Um, I have prepared a few slides. And I have to say at the outset that maybe I will say a few words about cyber um, diplomacy and multi-stakeholder diplomacy, but I'm not a diplomat myself and I focus on law, I don't focus on, on diplomacy. So probably the main examples that I will use today uh, uh, come from the law. The first 
um, observations that I would like to make is uh, basically the fact that when you deal with uh, a multi-stakeholder approach, you can very easily use the internet as an example because mm. you probably know that since the start, the internet was a collaboration. It was a collaboration between the government and universities, but then the private industry got in and, and, and everyone worked um, on, on developing this new network. Uh, so today you could say that there is a, a, a very strong collaboration between governments, private industry, academia, and various elements of the civil society to make the network function, to make the network work. Um, so today, and I'm borrowing this, um, um, this quote from, from, from this article from Kaja Siglik and John Herring from 2021, today you could say that the internet, it's, um, it's a global network that is, that has been built, maintained, and enabled by a wide, wide range of multi-stakeholder multi partners. So the problem that we face today um, um, currently is the fact that you have a web, an internet that has become increasingly centralized, increasingly dominated by a small number of very powerful actors, and this is probably what um, uh, cyberspace governance is about today, and what the multi-stakeholder approach is meant to change, because of course we don't want a few people like Mark Zuckerberg, like Jeff Bezos, like Elon Musk, um, decide uh, for us on um, major questions. So, as far as I can say, um, the reaction of governments to the, the current issues and this very centralized web owned by uh, private actors and, and, and very big companies, the reaction of governments is, and it's, it's true here in the EU, to regulate, mm -hmm. and I've listed here various examples of this, uh, um, uh, these attempts to regulate. Well, they are not just attempts, they are real regulations that were adopted. So when you look at what the EU did over the past years, you can see that the GDPR was adopted and implemented in 2018. The Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act uh, just entered into force and are uh, meant to regulate e-commerce, content moderation. Of course, data trades are being regulated as well. Um, so you could say, well, it's a very traditional way to look at regulation. It's a traditional way to try to rein in the cyber world. But what I would like to highlight here is that perhaps even if you look at all those new regulations, even if you might think that it's just bureaucracy, those attempts involve more actors than it was the case traditionally. And this is what I would like to show here. Um, and I would like to take the, the example of a regulation that I'm working on, which is, which is the Digital Services Act. The Digital Services Act entered into force on November 16, so it's very recent, and it is in the process of being implemented. The, the platforms have a few months to uh, get used to it and to um, 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 comply with the new regulation. And what I would like to submit uh, is the idea that maybe the DSA is another way to look at cyberspace governance that includes more actors and probably a more open approach. And I would like to uh, start with Jack Balkin's um, um, sentence. You might know his article, Free Speech is a Triangle. I think it was, it was published in, in the Yellow Review uh, in 2020 or 2021. It's a very uh, famous piece. Um, what is interesting in, in his approach is the fact that he opposes a dualist model of speech regulation that was in use in the 20th century with two basic kinds of players. On the one hand, territorial governments, on the other, and on the other hand, speakers. He opposes this dualist model to the current model. 
which according to, to him is a pluralist model with multiple players, nation states, the EU, but also those private companies that are so powerful today, mm. and many different kinds of speakers. So you have individuals like you and me, but you also have the media, you have civil society organizations, and he also mentions hackers and trolls. So this is many people. So that what I would like to say, of course, is that the DSA is not uh, based on this approach. But the DSA is taking into consideration, so this is an image, of, but the, the image is not, the, the quality of the image is unfortunately not very good. But you can see that he, he sees free speech as a triangle between all those different, different actors. So I wouldn't say that the DSA is built on Balkan's approach, no. But the DSA takes it to, into account the fact that today in the cyber world, you have various types of protagonists. And maybe it, should, it could be a good idea to involve them in cyberspace governance. So the first ever example that I could give to you from the DSA is the fact that trusted flaggers um, are um, um, clearly uh, empowered by the regulation to um, um, uh, report content, to report illegal content, and all the notices submitted by trusted flaggers will be given priority. So they are involved in the process of content moderation, which is quite something. It's, a, it's an important step here to involve those trusted. So of course they must be, um, they must be certified. You will have the authorities that will uh, um, um, make sure that they can be trusted. But it's a way to involve new types of act actors in the process of content moderation. The other aspect which is very important for us academics is the fact that the DSA provides for transparency obligations, but more specifically, more specifically provides that platforms should give vetted researchers access to data. And those researchers should be able to see everything, to look into everything, to assess the risks, and it's more specifically, the, the systemic risks that uh, uh, the platforms and the ways those platforms are run can raise. So this is, again, a very, very important aspect of the DSA, and I, I would like to uh, mention here that here in Sciences Po there will be a very important conference in the beginning of January on that specific topic with the, the team at the Media Lab that is very much involved in this um, uh, in the implementation of this regulation in this respect because researchers here are trusted to uh, highlight the systemic risks and to assess the platform's uh, um, um, management of those risks. Um, I will, I will um, move to, to my last point. Um, Beyond this regulation that can be seen as a traditional regulation, but, but is still involving more actors, you could also say, yes, but what about users? Well, users are given a role in the DSA because they can report content as well. So they, have, they are part of the process as well. You could say, well, the governance of the platforms could uh, give more space to users, well, users could probably be given the possibility to choose what they want online. For example, they could be given the possibility to choose the recommendation systems that they want. This is provided by the DSA as well. On the biggest platforms, you will be given the possibility to choose the recommendation system that you like. So, of course, you could go further. And this is what some platforms are currently doing and some, some tech experts are currently doing. Twitter has started this Blue Sky project a few years ago um, to really decentralize uh, social networks um, in order to, again, give users the possibility to choose what they want to use, which algorithms um, they want uh, in a marketplace. Uh, so this is the Blue Sky project, but again, the DSA provides exactly the same thing. And um, you might have had this experience if you go to 
certain networks like Mastodon. Um, it's a way to involve, again, uh, various stakeholders in the way the, the platform functions. So I will stop here. I think I was too long already. No, no. Um, but, um, but of course, we have room for discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Xel, and you were not too long. You, you respected really your time, uh, uh, 15 minutes, so congratulations for that. Uh, this is what we learn at Sciences Po, probably, and uh, it gives me the opportunity to say that because I, I, I forgot it that you also graduate from Sciences Po. And so, um, two graduates, right? Three with me. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Delcross. The and a, a couple of future graduates from Sciences Po. Oh, of, course, of course, of course, of course. All of them. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, and uh, it's a it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I also teach in Sciences Po, and uh, I thought last last Monday was my last class, but then you see, <laughs> I'm coming back uh, twice the same week, and it's a pleasure to to speak after Florence, because I uh, definitely uh, share uh, 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 the um, her assessment. Uh, and I would say uh, maybe uh, a sense or that you probably can already feel like uh, cyber diplomacy or regulating the internet uh, cannot work the old good way uh, regulators uh, were used to uh, implement um, uh, uh, legislation. Um, so the perspective uh, that I will uh, try to share with you is based on my own practice. Um, what I see uh, in different countries all over the world um, and uh, uh, whether there is convergence on what Florence just described, whether there are competing models and at the end of the day, uh, what are the, the perspectives? Uh, maybe the first thing um, is, uh, 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 it was not taken for granted that uh, the internet and data should be regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, you will all remember, um, I think no less than 10 years ago, the international uh, conversation was around like um, data is the new oil, uh, you regulators, especially in Brussels, you're stupid. Uh, you are late. Um, why on earth uh, do you want by adopting regulations to limit international data flows? Do you want to shoot yourself in the foot? Um, you're pitching regulation against technology, against progress. So this is uh, the usual kind of uh, Eurocrat in his, uh, you know, ivory tower, disconnected from the, from the reality. Um, and we will see that uh, there have been a few wake-up calls, um, which brought not only the EU, but lots of countries around the world to actually regulate. And those wake-up calls were first and foremost uh, Cambridge Analytica, uh, Cambridge Analytica, which definitely mm. showed that mm. when personal data is not protected, it does not only have an impact on you and me and the individual whose personal data are misused, but it has a societal impact. It can also twist the electoral system of one of the most adv uh, advanced democracy uh, in the world. Um, so maybe here we start to realize that data is not just the new oil. That's for personal data. Non-personal data it can be any information. Think about disinformation, uh, how that can be spread on the social media, and how by, of course, targeting not only specific people at a specific time, you can also twist uh, the electoral uh, process. So then you realize that maybe non-personal data would also need to be regulated. Uh, and I would not even mention, of course, abuse of surveillance. 
social scoring system, which we all know now, are imposed in some countries as a way to control the population. Then if you are a democracy, you might think maybe it's not just the new oil. And of course, it's an economic necessity, meaning that regulating data also means enabling trust um, and uh, uh, giving the consumer the trust that they need to actually share the data with this network versus uh, this, uh, this other one. But having said that, um, if regulating data now is a no-brainer, um, it's a challenge for the regulator. Um, so maybe the first thing is faced with this challenge, because data, of course, is immaterial, doesn't know any border, so is the territorial scope of the legislation still relevant? There is, of course, this catch-up between innovation and the length of the regulatory process, and simply speaking, the technicalities of this whole new world, and the, uh, let's say, um, the capacity of the regulator to know what happened, to monitor what happened, and to enforce uh, its own uh, regulation. That in a global context. So the challenge is huge. And confronted with this challenge, uh, what we see first is, as France just explained, a, a reaction not only by the EU, but by several countries around the world, which are converging on implementing new data protection framework. So maybe first I will look into the convergence and then sc scratch a little bit beyond the surface and see that in fact there are some huge differences in the way uh, the different regulators try to apprehend uh, this phenomenon. And I already feel that I will be longer than 15 minutes, so apologies. Um, having said that, I, I can speak as long as I want, isn't it? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, really? On, 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 on the convergence, um, there is an increasing number of countries around the world adopting uh, data protection regulations. So it's not like the big EU being post-colonialist imposing its model around the world. It's India last week, which stabled its second draft data protection to the Lok Sabha, to the Indian um, Legislative Assembly. It's Indonesia uh, three, uh, three months ago. It's 120 countries, or more than so. Kenya, Brazil, um, Argentina, you name it. Even in the US, at states level, um, Virginia, Colorado, Connecticut, Utah, and Surprise, surprise, I mean, those who were pitching regulation against innovation, the very Silicon Valley state home, California, uh, has a data protection law and uh, will soon enforce an upgraded uh, version uh, of this law in January. And the interesting things is not only the number, more than 120 countries, but the um, similarities between those laws. And most of those laws do, um, um, uh, do share some kind of core principles. Applying, they apply both to public authorities and to the private sector. Um, you have new obligations on what we call the data processors, new rights for individuals, and new way of uh, checks and balance, like new oversight mechanism. 70% uh, overlap between those um, uh, regulations around the world. This is what the OECD just found in a uh, recent uh, report. And interestingly, this is not a Western democracy kind of trend. China joined the club. In 2021, China adopted the PIPL, Personal Information Protection Law, uh, which does share many similarities. Definition of personal data, new rights for individuals, applying, in theory, both to public and private sectors uh, with key principles, which are very similar to the GDPR, purpose limitation, legality, and so on. So you would think maybe, uh, maybe we are on the same basket. 
Uh, and that's where we need to scratch a little bit beyond the surface and look into what are the key differentiators. How is it that we can distinguish ourselves in the way we regulate data? And of course, this is not a minor issue, given that the United States of America do not have a data protection framework at federal level. Hence, the difficulty for them to actually project a regulatory model. When you don't have one, it's quite difficult. And second, to distinguish themselves with China, which has its own regulation. Um, main difference with, uh, with China on substance first, and I just give you a sense, uh, this is not supposed to be uh, uh, the whole list of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 an exhaustive list of differences, but you have data localization provisions uh, in the Chinese law, whereby you need to store critical data on the Chinese territory. Huh? Why? Is it necessary for data protection reasons? They would think so. The new law equipped China with a retaliatory instrument. So if you, the big EU, restrict data flows to China for whatever data protection reason, we can retaliate. Article 43 of the PIP. Does it have anything to do with data protection? No, it's more like a power-based kind of relation. And interestingly, as I told you, indeed, the law applied to the government itself. So you, I am telling you that the Chinese government is regulated by data protection law. Sounds counterintuitive, isn't it? But in fact, who is in charge of enforcing, controlling the government? The quick response, Article 60 of the PIPL, is the government itself. The so-called CAC, Cyber Administration of China, meaning that if you don't give this oversight power to an independent body, it says a lot about the way the government can influence those who can control themselves. Maybe just to echo what Florence just said, in terms of difference between the Chinese regulation and, I would say, other regulations around the world, it's not only on substance, it's also on governance. So the way multi-stakeholders are brought into the picture, are associated, not only to draft the legislation, but to implement the legislation. And I will not dwell on the uh, 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 DSA that uh, Florence explained very well. But just to say that the GDPR and the, G and the DSA have in common this ambition of creating, if I may say so, no new ecosystem. It's all about creating new rights, equipping first and foremost individuals with these new rights, and trying to put in place instruments to correct the imbalance between you and me and the big Facebook, which knows everything about you, but you don't know everything about them. Hence, uh, what Florence just explained, the trusty flaggers, for example, new organization in charge of controlling how the platforms are doing their moderation online. But in the GDPR, for example, the possibility for class action the possibility that groupings would represent you in a lawsuit against Meta, which last week was fined by the Irish Data Protection Authority close to 300 million euros. So interesting that this notion of putting in place an ecosystem uh, does not only come from the legislator, but I would dare to say also from the judge, the Court of Justice. And if you look at uh, the uh, judgment of the Court of Justice in the right to be forgotten seminal case called the Costera case, what in substance the highest court uh, in Europe told Google was, Google, you are not a plumber. You, Google, uh, uh, you explain us that you only care about fixing the pipes and you're not responsible for the quality of the water that goes within it. 
because you know I'm not a filtering kind of, and I don't want to get any legal responsibility for poisoning the consumer. I'm just a pipe maker, and I just connect. The Court of Justice responded, no. You're also responsible for what is online, contrary to what the US law says. And you are not only responsible, but I will give you, Google, the uh, obligation to exert a quasi-judiciary function. You, Google, tomorrow, you will have to balance the right for freedom of speech, for free information, with the right to be forgotten, which is a balancing kind of act, which by nature is something that a church would need to do. Who asked Google to do that? The Court of Justice, the church itself. So just to go in the direction of Florence, there is a recognition not only by the legislator, but also uh, by the judge himself on the need to involve multi-stakeholders in the way we would need to implement the regulation. That in stark contrast with China. In China, you could just ask yourself, where is Jack Ma? I mean, Jack Ma was the iconic figure of the uh, internet uh, economy. Where is Jack Ma? He disappeared. So it looks like even one of the most powerful platform there, when it become critical, it become critical for the government itself. Interestingly, um, in 2021, the Chinese Uber called Didi mm -hmm. uh, had high ambition, he wanted to go international. And when you want to go international, you want to go to Wall Street and get some new funding uh, for your international aspirations. But the Chinese government was not really enthusiastic, to say the least, with this perspective that this big Chinese giant would uh, uh, go to Wall Street and get new, fresh US dollars. So there were some signals that were sent to the management of Didi not to do so. Maybe you should wait before going on the US stock exchange. They choose to disregard that. It was on the 30th of June, 2021. Um, the stocks, DD stocks, were listed at $15, the share, right? Two days after, DD was subject to a raid by the Chinese Data Protection Authority, one of the first important ones after the entry into force of the PIP there. The share now are at $2. So it also says a lot in terms of involving other stakeholders into a cooperative approach, into a co-regulatory approach, or exerting a top-down approach where enforcement would meet control. So here again, maybe you have an interesting marker. And probably with, the, with what I just told you, I would say that uh, uh, the two very important things that you need to watch out for in terms of how uh, different governments would approach data regulation is one, this one. To what extent do you involve the whole community and to what extent you see yourself government, of course, as an enforcer of last resort, but also as a key enabler of this ecosystem, which is necessary to bring the platforms within a co-regulatory approach. And second criteria, who controls the Leviathan? Who controls the government? Uh, these are two very strong markers that can help uh, distinguish different regulatory uh, culture. In conclusion, and I know, yeah, it's 10 minutes, isn't it? Uh, in conclusion, uh, what I just want to say is talk a bit about uh, the international aspect. What I'm just trying to say, it's all good that the regulator, uh, the uh, EU is just so proud to have the first mover advantage and be the first one to legislate on the GDPR, the same piece of legislation that Mark Zuckerberg spent uh, dozens of US millions, uh, uh, US dollars 
uh, dozen millions of US dollars to lobby against. And the same mark, uh, after the Cambridge Analytica came to the European Parliament and to the US Congress, and made the case for the GDPR to be the global standard. This is his words. So that's an interesting U term, isn't it? Um, what I'm just trying to say is um, involving companies is a must, but working with like-minded countries is a necessity. And there is so much that you can do if you are you little regulator pitching against China, good luck. If you are on your own trying to persuade the world not to use TikTok, there are some limits to what you can do. If you work together as the Trump administration started to do with Secretary Pompeo, everybody has forgotten about this guy, um, to uh, 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 have a coalition of, country, of, of willing, in this case it was again Huawei, but maybe to promote common values, maybe you are stronger. And in an international context where there is no such thing as a world data organization, and the parallel, for example, with environment is quite clear, there is no world environmental organization with a similar kind of uh, international issue which doesn't know any border, means that you can only have an impact if you work with like-minded countries. And here there are a couple of interesting initiatives underway. And I would just name one, maybe, because this is uh, one that uh, uh, will become reality in uh, 10 days from now. And that has a potential in terms of working as an international standard, also to help make the distinction that I was just referring to. At the OECD, uh, countries, and you know that the OECD is just composed by democracies sharing similar values, rule of law, blah, blah. Um, ministers uh, in 10 days from now will adopt, for the first time, international standards that will define what is not acceptable in terms of disproportionate government surveillance. And you know, uh, there were some arguments which were being made. Hey, the same guys who had the Snowden and the NSA uh, are uh, preaching about rule of law kind of surveillance? Hey, come on. But here, in 10 days from now, we will have international standards. There were no such thing before. Those would be quite useful if we want to draw a clear line between our way of regulating data in a human-centric kind of manner, and the way others would use data regulation to control their people. So that's as far as the standard is concerned. It's a good news. Clarification on those standards is more helpful than relying on the EU standards only. And second, you may ask, but where to enforce those standards? What is the appropriate forum at the international level to deal with this? And interestingly, there are a couple of different initiatives. The Japanese who are chairing the G7 next year are already floating ideas on getting um, a small group, i.e. the G7, work together to enforce those standards together. That's an idea. Other ideas are to promote the declaration for freedom of the internet. We can talk about that, which was a Joe Biden initiative at the beginning of the year in order to bring in more countries. But what I'm just trying to say is that despite the difference in culture between the United States, for example, and Europe, it's true that there is no better way of getting closer than being challenged by a similar system. And that's where we are now. In that's what we are uh, 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 working on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our two speakers for this uh, very uh, insightful uh, presentation. And uh, now we will have time to, to discuss. I have also to uh, add one point. Uh, we were supposed to have three speakers, but uh, uh, one of them, uh, Mr. Lieflander from uh, 
NATO uh, was not able to attend because he had to go to uh, a last-minute uh, meeting, so uh, he uh, is presenting his apologies. So we'll have discussion between Madame Gzel and, and Mr. Del Cross. Maybe I'm starting with, uh, with the first question. Uh, it was very interesting to um, listen to your two complementary presentation because you very much focus on the question of regulation. Listening to you, uh, we have the impression that uh, where well, regulation first, it first stands is, uh, is, 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 is a state issue, right? It's, uh, it's very, much, uh, very much controlled by uh, each state, except the EU, which is a sort of, uh, of exception. But uh, the objective is, of course, to go toward global standard, glo uh, towards international governance. Uh, well, you've been very optimistic at the end of your, uh, of your speech, but on the other way, we get the impression that, that uh, there are also many obstacles right, to go uh, toward this, uh, this international governance, and, and not only between authoritarian states and, and democracy. The example you mentioned uh, uh, between the US and, and EU, the interpretation of the European Court of Justice, for instance, is very different from, uh, from uh, uh, the US, uh, uh, well, legal interpretation of the notion of responsibility, right? So are we really going towards an international governance? Uh, is, it, is it something which could be effective, or is it just, as we say in French, un vœu pieux, right, a sort of uh, idealistic objective that will be very difficult to achieve? So that's my first my first question. Would you like to start? Uh, well, yes, I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure that it's an answer, but at least uh, it's a way to say that I agree that it's complicated. And the example I would like to give, because I didn't have the, the time to mention it uh, when I made my presentation, is the example of the TTC. And maybe, uh, um, of course, Christian might say a few words about it, but you probably know that the the Trade and Technology Council gathered for the first time um, in the spring, I think. Um, um, it, it was actually launched during, um, in June 2021, and uh, you had high expectations for this TTC. Um, no, the first gathering was in September 2021, and it was very quickly opened to stakeholders. You might have seen this um, EU platform called Futurium, um, that makes possible for anyone to um, uh, participate in the discussion. Mm -hmm. So, so it's it's an attempt. But every so in the last spring, the second meeting took place, which was which mostly focused on the war on on, on Russia. Uh, it was also said, and maybe Christian knows more uh, about this than I do, but it was also said that it was very difficult for Americans and Europeans to reach an agreement on, 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 a, on a list of topics. And the next meeting of the TTC will take place in a few days, and I, I read this morning that Thierry Breton will not attend it. And, and uh, so maybe I could, I could leave uh, this to Christian. But, yeah, it would be interesting uh, to know but why. Is, does, it, does it show something? Does it show that the expectations are not met? Does it show that it's so difficult to discuss with um, uh, uh, the Americans' counterparts? Uh, so so the, it's more a question than an answer, I, I think. Thank you, France. Yeah? Fabien. OK. Um, there are different levels of uh, uh, cooperation between uh, like-minded countries, if I may say. Um, uh, the TTC uh, works at bilateral level, and it's not only with the US, it will, not, it will soon be with, with India. There are also so-called digital uh, uh, partnership with uh, Korea, Singapore, uh, Japan. Um, this is one layer. This is often very technical. This is about trying to coordinate on uh, future standards. We didn't mention that. But uh, international standardization body are absolutely key. 
you know who is the chair of the standardization group on facial recognition uh, of the ITU in Geneva? It was the director of Huawei uh, International Relations, okay? So there have been years of investment from certain countries into these international multilateral bodies which were somehow left aside by uh, other countries. Uh, what I'm just trying to say is this is one layer. Uh, there are, of course, differences, and Christian is fully right. Legal difference, you mentioned responsibility. Uh, there are many other differences. I just, just said uh, the US don't have a data protection legislation. Um, having said that, and despite that, um, uh, President Biden issued a presidential decree on the 7th of October last to actually upgrade the uh, US uh, legislative arsenal and process uh, to actually match uh, the requirement from the EU Court of Justice. So it's quite interesting that in today's world, uh, you have the US president issuing new legal order in order to respond to the EU Court of Justice. So in terms of multi-stakeholders, it's quite also interesting. Um, is it effective? Uh, it's too early to say, uh, but if you ask the global platform, you could say yes. Um, uh, Microsoft, uh, which I understand uh, uh, has some fingerprint in this conference, um, when surveying its users about data protection, discovered that those who were asking for some more rights who wanted their data to be deleted in some cases, who wanted to exert a right for correction, or you name it, or data portability, blah, blah. There were more requests from US customers mm -hmm. than EU customers. So at the end of the day, beyond the surface, we need to see how the platform okay. do actually adapt their own, um, their own uh, uh, processes. And by default, the standard that they have taken is the GDPR. So that's, that's very interesting for political scientists. It means mm -hmm. that the definition of like-minded is not, well, what the law is made of, but it's more the expectations of the society and the way the society has a possibility to say, well, we would like to have regulation or not, right? That's, the, that's, that's what makes countries like-minded. I would think welcome to the multi-stakeholder world, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, to yeah. respond to your question. Yeah. Uh, meaning that uh, what I try to say is one of the key difference um, in the way we try to regulate as opposed to the Chinese way, if I may uh, uh, draw this uh, very kind of broad distinction, um, is also very much to be seen in the difference in the way we involve multi-stakeholders, mm -hmm. including the individuals. Mm -hmm. One of the key pillars of the GDPR is to equip the individuals with new rights uh, and to give them the processes to enforce them, even against the government, even against foreign government, for that sake. Of course, this is in stark contrast uh, with, the, uh, with the Chinese way. So mm -hmm. creating this ecosystem mm -hmm. is a clear distinguisher. Thank you very much. Uh, I suggest that now we are opening the debate and we're going to take your, your questions. So uh, just to explain you how we're going to proceed, we're going to take a series of uh, two, three questions. <laughs> And then I will go back to, uh, to the panel to ask uh, uh, each of the panelists a, a, an answer. So, who would like to start? Yes, please. You have two questions, okay. Um, the first one, oh, thank you. The first one is about the content moderation. Um, you talked about the trusted flaggers and uh, making sure that they're trusted. 
Uh, who is, um, I'm sorry if it's an ignorant question, but who takes leadership on this and how would you evaluate the European Union's capacity to deal with the large amount of users that are on social media spaces? That's the first question. And the second question is, so in the beginning of uh, Russian war in Ukraine, um, the cyberspace was used as another battlefield. And names, on, and names and faces of uh, Russian soldiers were published and they published information about the objects that they stole from occupied areas. And how do you think this kind of warfare in the cyberspace era should be treated? Should data protection be universal and should these Ukrainian actors be punished for this? Thank you. Thank you. I saw two demands. Well, for, first, yes, your colleague and then you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my question is about cybersecurity and it comes back to, well, something that we all heard about in 2013, uh, I guess, well, when Edward Snowden uh, sneaked all information about NSA and how they were mon monitoring not only Americans but also foreign governments. And um, this, this was the first time I got interested about spy cyberspace and cybersecurity. And if we uh, jump to 2019, I met uh, a head security diplomat of Brazil, because I come from Brazil, and he explained to me that since then, there is no, he thought there's no development on cybersecurity on foreign uh, protection and sovereignty over countries. Um, I would like to hear your opinion on that and how do you think this is evolving for the last years? Um, how can we make sure we have cybersecurity for our public actors, for our governments? Thank you. Thank you. Could you just pass the mic? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. I think my question is sort of related to what she just asked. Um, so when we think about the cyberspace, I presume we're also talking about the state actors. Um, but from what I've listened to, we're more sort of concentrated in the private sector and how to regulate their behavior. But my question actually tails back to what he calls the Leviathan. Who controls the state actors who conduct, you know, some sort of attacks on other state actors, and in this case, perhaps critical infrastructure. We have the colonial pipelines and of course all of those who actually, how do you imagine the, the multi-stakeholder approach in, in helping you know, control state behavior in cyberspace? Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to stop here and then we'll have another series. Maybe Florence, you'd like to start? Well, I will start with the, the first two questions. Uh, on your first questions, on, on your first question on, on trusted flaggers, um, they will be selected and certified by the, the national coordinator for digital services because as usual, in, um, as it's, it's, it's usually the case with uh, European regulations, you, those regulations can be enforced directly by the European Commission in certain exceptional cases, but in most cases is for the national authorities to implement and enforce those regulations. And in this case, in the case of the DSA, there will be a national coordinator that will be designated in, in each country. In France, it, it, it should be the ARCOM, but no, it will not be exclusively the ARCOM. Uh, you have other, the CNIL, uh, the DGCCRF, well, I just, um, but you have various authorities, various yeah, first yeah, authorities that might intervene, but it will probably be the ARCOM. Uh, and of course, those authorities, those coordinators will be in charge of verifying that um, those trusted flaggers can be trusted. On an annual basis, there will be annual reports that, be, that will be written by those trusted flaggers. Uh, so, so, of course, uh, they, there will be a verification process. Um, on your second question, of course, you have multiple users um, on the social networks. The, the whole implementations of those new regulations, and it's the case also with the Digital Markets Act, raise, um, uh, raises questions. Uh, because, um, of course, um, the national authorities and the, and the European Commission need um, the resources, and even the human resources, and even the te technical resources to enforce those regulations, and this is something that is currently uh, uh, discussed 
because of course you have skepticism, you have people that, are, that, that don't believe that we have, we already have even in France, um, and even at the level of the, of the authorities that I have just mentioned, that we have enough people and enough qualified people to um, implement those rules. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a current issue. What, what are the qualifications required for this kind of uh, task? Uh, I would say we need engineers. Okay. The, 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 there is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a jurist myself, but we have plenty of jurists. <laughs> so I, I would say that we need, we need people that are, that are really trained um, uh, in computer science, in data science, and, and uh, of course, and it's, it's a complicated task. One, one good point is that, as I said, um, you, w w there will be um, collaborations with researchers um, whose, whose uh, expertise will be very helpful, especially to determine, for example, if, let's say, the Twitter algorithm is biased, um, it will be possible to, to rely on the expertise of researchers. But again, this creates confidentiality questions, confi confidentiality issues. So, so it's, a, it's a long process. Thank you. Uh, oh, oh you, you would like to add something? Uh, just one thing, because I don't have the, the answers. So these are very complicated questions. Man. And I, someone asked, uh, maybe it's with you or, or, or you, well, about what the, Ukrainian, the Ukrainians did at the beginning of the war and what the, what the rules should be. Um, so this is, a, I, and I'm not, I'm not an expert on those questions, but it has, alway, it has always been a question to determine what people are allowed to do in, in times of war. What I would like just to highlight is the fact that, for example, and you might remember that, um, after the war started, the platforms made decisions. And for example, Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg decided that he, will, he would allow calls for violence from Ukrainians mm -hmm. against Russians. And it was Mark Zuckerberg's decision alone. And so this is, this is my main concern. Is it for Mark Zuckerberg to make that kind yeah. of decision? And so, yes, there is room for probably a multi-stakeholder multi approach on those questions that are very sensitive questions. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah no, very, very, very much so. Just uh, maybe a couple of... Uh, of addition uh, uh, to what Florence uh, just explained. Um, so he explained very well uh, the system of uh, accreditation or certification of uh, trusted uh, flaggers. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, there will also be transparency requirement on those trusted flaggers uh, in charge of monitoring uh, transparency on the internet. So they would need to um, uh, uh, communicate uh, on the uh, source for financing, for example. Um, so it's interesting because uh, this goes to the point that I was trying to make, which is the regulator putting in place checks and balance. Mm -hmm. It's not only the regulator uh, imposing a new hard law kind of obligation, it's the regulator creating an ecosystem, including empowering new actors, uh, Florence also referred in her presentation to the accredited researchers. So basically, researchers who would be empowered to open the black box of the Google, to go into uh, the Mountain Views uh, algorithm, uh, and so on. So these are new, um, uh, these are new uh, 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 ways of creating these checks and balances and shedding more transparency uh, into, uh, into the system. Uh, indeed, and uh, Florence explained that very well, uh, there are limits to data protection. Uh, data protection is not an absolute right. It's a fundamental right, uh, meaning that uh, it's a condition for other rights to be exerted. How can you exert your civil rights without uh, the secrecy of the vote being protected, for example? So you see, but it's not an absolute right. It has some limits. In time of war, or for security reasons, of course, um, no one will, uh, uh, will uh, ask whether uh, uh, the um, uh, suspected terrorist has given his or her consent before you know, uh, uh, the uh, intelligence community would have access to uh, his social network. So in time of war, of course, 
there are limits mm. uh, to this, sure. uh, which doesn't mean that some principles cannot still be applied in terms of you know proportionality, necessity, and the, and so on. Um, as far as cybersecurity is concerned, it's a very uh, interesting um, topic, uh, which um, is at the crossroad, of course, uh, of those uh, of those discussions. Huh? Uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, is not only, uh, as its own name uh, 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 reveals, a security-related uh, issue, uh, thereby very close to the Leviathan power uh, of, you know. Uh, making sure that the infrastructure um, uh, is in place and that the protection is in place. Huh? And uh, it is true that it gives rise to uh, different um, interpretations depending on the sovereign uh, which interpret that. Um, interestingly, uh, the first Chinese uh, law on data was related to uh, security huh? and cyber security. Because in China, security comes first, and the maintenance of social order uh, by the same token. Interestingly, um, recourse to security is today the basis for the United States, absent of a federal legislation and data protection, to actually control import and export of data, if I may, if I may say so. You would bar, for example, um, the uh, Chinese acquisition of Grindr, the gay uh, meeting app, on security basis. Uh, today, the committee in charge of screening foreign direct investment in the US, called the CFIUS, don't know if you're familiar with this, um, has extended its scope. The CFIUS is in charge of making sure, traditionally it was, okay, maybe Saudi Arabia will not have the right to um, uh, by this telecom infrastructure. Why? Because this is security matter. Okay, too bad for Saudi Arabia. Today, it's China doesn't have the right to buy grinder, or you must sell your uh, 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 your shares, you uh, uh, TikTok that you had in a social network uh, in the U.S. So what I'm just trying to say is recourse to security, uh, absence of data protection can still uh, uh, provide the US executive um, a way to monitor, uh, uh, in a way, uh, international transfer of, of data. In the EU, uh, we are um, uh, drafting a cybersecurity new legislation. We have uh, 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 the ENISA, the European uh, uh, Cybersecurity Agency, uh, which uh, given that the security competence is very much with our member states, has more a role of a convener, but tomorrow we'll have a role of a certifier. And uh, we will edict new uh, EU-wide standards related to cybersecurity uh, as well. So this is, uh, this is in the making, indeed. Okay, I will just add something. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the question is, so for example, um, I think sometime last year, mm -hmm. the Microsoft that affected the EBA, the European Bank Authority. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about situations like that where you perceive that this is the action from a state actor. How would France respond? How would the EU respond you know, to a state actor or a state-backed attack? How would, you know, how, do you have some sort of framework on how to respond to situations like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I think the, um, uh, the you mentioned the French. The French military service has uh, a couple of thousand uh, engineers uh, who are part of a specific branch uh, specialized in cyber attacks. Uh, so it's not only defending uh, the critical infrastructure, but apparently it's also attacking uh, others. Uh, this has been also used to support uh, the uh, Ukrainians uh, in the context of the, uh, of the uh, ongoing war. So it's something which is done at state level, as much as you know, military is a uh, is a competence of member states uh, in the EU. Thank you. Thank we you. have time for another row of questions. So, uh, who would like to take the floor? Yes, please. So first of all, thank you very much. Um, 
A couple of days ago, the United States announced that it would be banning uh, the sale of all Huawei products in the United States. So in, in this case, if I would relate this to the framework you presented, it would be one stakeholder deciding to ban the products of another stakeholder on the grounds of uh, security concerns. Is this what a multi-stakeholder diplomacy would look like? Fragmentation? Or should we rather opt for a more centralized way of reconciling different stakeholders um, in order yeah, to, to derive uh, cyberspace governance? Thank you. Other question? No? Okay. Then I'll give you the floor to answer this question, which would be the last one. Can, maybe I can come, come first. I mean, um, this is not the first, this is not the last. Uh, decision uh, taken on the, by the United States on security uh, uh, on a security base on the 7th of October uh, uh, export control limitation of critical technology uh, to China were also put in uh, in force um, so this again says a lot about how much recourse to security now in the United States, absence of other legal bases available, is used uh, as a way to, uh, uh, I would say, monitor uh, tech transfer, uh, outbound and inbound uh, 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 tech transfer. Interestingly, this is, I would tend to think, something that is very, uh, I would say, bipartisan in the US system. When I referred to Mike Pompeo, he was, uh, at the origin of a so-called safe uh, internet or safe network initiative, which ambition was exactly this. Bring together like-minded countries so as to agree on minimum standards that we could apply in public procurement and military public procurement as well, um, so as to um, actually have a critical mass of countries sharing the same values um, that would um, um, uh, take similar decisions relating, for example, to uh, to use of uh, of uh, Huawei uh, uh, technologies. Um, so, is it satisfactory? No, of course. And by the way, um, the United States uh, did uh, impose trade barriers in the name of security to. EU cars, EU automotive industry. What's the connection? Nobody knows. Um, so it gives a sense of how discretionary this legal basis can be about. Uh, then, uh, indeed, uh, the way forward, uh, including from the United States, it's to bring like-minded countries uh, along. And this is interesting. When you are the so-called superpower in a position of uh, monopole in terms of, uh, or duopole, I think, you still feel the need to bring other like-minded countries along when it is about addressing the Chinese challenge. Hence, the, um, uh, this uh, declaration on the freedom of the internet launched by the Biden administration, hence uh, the uh, subscription and the support from the Biden administration to these um, new international OECD standards against mass uh, uh, surveillance. Um, hence, maybe tomorrow, new institutional arrangements at international level that could bring uh, like-minded countries together. This is in the making, um, and this is what we are working on. Like yes, I would one. like. I just would like to say that I, I strongly agree. Um, in the declaration for the future of the internet, uh, you have various. So you, of course, you've heard of it. Um, um, you have various um, um, statements that that clearly uh, reject a certain vision of of the internet, uh, um, and and so I would say that this approach is basically uh, based on the idea of 
bringing, bringing together like-minded people that share the same values. And I would even probably add uh, that, that it's part of those values to involve the, the civil society mm -hmm. and to do what was announced with the TTC, involving new actors, mm -hmm. uh, taking in, into account their suggestions and their, and their ideas. So, so this is, what is problematic now is that we are, we are still in a situation where the internet is fragmented and with those new, dis new decisions, we, we are, now we have basically two blocks. Uh, and um, and yes, it's um, it's a, it's a diff difficult situation. I don't have anything else to say. But yes, it's it's it may be problematic, but as our Western countries, the ones that started all this, um, and this is basically we conclude by this. But the strategy of a sovereign internet that that it was started by China and by Russia, um, it's the final implication to have a, a fragmented internet that separates from the, 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 the internet of the Western countries and, and that do not um, implement the same approach and the same values. Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're going to give you a mic, it would be yeah, sorry. easier. Uh, about the banning from the um, US market from Chinese, uh, for Chinese companies. Uh, so you said, for uh, Mr. De Croce, uh, that um, the U.S. were trying to um, to reunite like-minded countries, but we've seen that since 2019, the Europe actually didn't follow along. So are they really like-minded countries, or does Europe have another strategy about uh, about Chinese companies? Do, do they see banning as not uh, the right tool? Do they see other tools? Do they have a strategy? Uh, no, that's my question. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Okay, then back to you, Fabian. Um, there is no such thing uh, as um, EU a public procurement uh, facility for the telecom sector. Uh, we, we learned uh, through uh, the COVID crisis uh, that we would need to put in place a common buying facilities for vaccines, drugs, etc. Uh, but uh, when it is about uh, putting in place, equipping your own you know, uh, country with um, uh, uh, Technologies. This is a sovereign decision. So there are indeed attempts at Brussels level to coordinate, uh, but Brussels doesn't have uh, the decision uh, power on this. Um, having said that, um, contributing to international standards that could be used. Uh, and referred to uh, by Brussels and not only by member states uh, can also help uh, bringing uh, EU countries together and uh, uh, speaking from a, a common uh, hymn sheet. Um, so this is in progress, this is not satisfactory, uh, but this is where we are aiming at. And maybe just a footnote. Just to say that it's not like the ganging up against China. Huh? It's, a, it's a simply uh, standing for a certain vision, human-centric vision, uh, which very much resonates with what it is that we want to do for artificial intelligence, for example. Mm -hmm. Do you want to let high-risk artificial intelligence, for example, facial recognition system monitored by a foreign government, to actually freely enter our market? Certainly not. And this is, you know, the kind of decision that uh, is in the pipeline, that we, is coming, but that can only have an influence if taken together with other uh, countries. And maybe just to insist that this projection of, you know, your own values into an external kind of stance, in a kind of uh, um, diplomatical uh, posture, it's not specific to the Western democratic world. 
uh, China has launched uh, three years from now its own data security initiative, which aims to actually project its own regulatory model. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is proactively uh, trying to pursue this route. Yeah. And it's quite interesting also to watch this place out, also because there are uh, doubts that a strategy which is mainly based on leave me in peace, I want to be sovereign on my own territory with my own vision of maintenance of the social order, uh, is exp can be exported. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beyond North Korea, I mean, yeah. It's interesting because it's another example of, uh, uh, well, you try to become influential in the international system by projecting your normative model, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's like climate change. It was also an, 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 an issue where you have to project your, your model. And the EU is not bad at all. But the problem of the EU is that sometimes at the end the EU is not able to have a sort of political leadership, right? But on climate change, is the EU which has projected the first norms as well, right? So the, 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 the parallel with climate change is really interesting. These are both global issues, don't know any borders. And for both issues, there is a, a, an international governance gap. Uh, maybe the thing which is specific to data is uh, the capacity of misuse by government to control its population and uh, the need to defend yourself uh, against not only intrusion but against, I would say, aggression um, uh, uh, from uh, other states, which gives the data sphere a, b a bit more of, uh, I would say, uh, a different kind of, uh, uh, of twist. Indeed, uh, the EU uh, ha is a normative power, uh, also because it has the first comer advantage. In, uh, but take the uh, climate example. The EU came first to actually impose carbon emission um, uh, uh, markets and, uh, and, uh, and limits. Actually, those who today in the world are imposing the most ambitious cap and trade systems are the Chinese. Um, so it also says uh, something about our capacity to export, but maybe to be more positive and, uh, uh, on the digital uh, sphere, it's true that if you combine the EU regulatory power with the US uh, uh, business and tech power, then maybe you can gain some critical mass and possible influence. Uh, I would I would just like to add one word uh, one one word to this because uh, you might have seen that it was two three years ago when the when the RCEP uh, had to deal with um, um, the, the deployment of the five G technology in France. Um, there was a concern about Huawei, uh, mm. the, the Huawei um, devices that were used by the French telecommunications companies. And uh, um, if, if my memory works well, um, the RCEP made the decision to exclude those Huawei devices uh, from, from the devices that, that, that were authorized. Uh, which was a decision that was contested by the French telecommunications companies like Orange. Uh, who wanted to use this technology? Okay. And, and the question was a question of national security. What I find interesting, and it's the same with, with uh, the questions related to the cloud, is that we see um, decisions probably based on political considerations and national security concerns. We see those decisions made um, through um, uh, technical requirements. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with the cloud. In France, we now have a very specific certification mm -hmm. for a cloud system, which is called Secnum Cloud. And, and this, um, this certification includes some legal requirements while it's a technical certification. So, so this is interesting because you see 
legal and political consideration no included in uh, um, what is meant to be um, purely technical requirements. And probably this is wor the world we, we live in. Technology, um, policy, uh, law are, are intertwined. Mm -hmm. Which means for research that uh, the classic division between social sciences and, and hard sciences doesn't make sense anymore, right? <laughs> okay, well, uh, we, are, we are slowly reaching the end of, uh, of this seminar and I think uh, we benefited a lot from uh, what we, we heard. Thank you to all of you for, for your input and please let me join me to thank our two panelists. <laughs>who will discuss digital sovereignty and digital authoritarianism. So this is, a, of course, a question that was, that basically you raised. Uh, and we will ha then have two panels, one on, on Russia and the other one on, on China. So if you're interested, feel free to register. We, we might have a full room yet, but you can, uh, you can um, watch online. So, so you can register. Thank you very much. So another event to go. Merci.